Increasingly, what I think is, what I've learned to understand through interviewing people, whether they've engaged in terrorist violence, in peaceful protests, uh, whether they're artists or sports performers and so on, or whether they're talking to me about their experiences of erotic love as well, is that fundamentally, we're an interrelational being. I'm a being in the world, I'm a being with others, and I'm a being with myself. So we've all been born into a world that's preceded us. There is a way of understanding that world before I get there. So if you uh, are born in a particular environment, a particular tribal environment, it will be different from the environment we've grown up in. So in terms of this being with the world, being with the self, being with others, surely there are some circumstances where just by virtue of who I am and the way that I'm born, I am a particular person. Most simply, we might look at something like gender and our biology and say, well, I know what it is to be a woman. I know what it is to be a man. And I've picked deliberately prototypical images of it as well. But Heidegger tells us that even then, I am a being in the world. So I am in the world that understands what it is to be a woman, that understands what it is to be a man. And I become completely absorbed in that world. There's a form of transparent coping, of competence that I develop, so that I almost seamlessly slip into that world. Now, any of you who are interested in anthropology and sociology and so on will know that if you go and join another group, all of those things that are invisible to us as an outsider, sorry, are invisible to the inside, become visible to the outside. And isn't it strange the way that they're working like this? In short, what he's saying is, we grow up and we do what one does. So we're either born into a particular environment, we choose an environment, or we fall into it in some way. So the young boy who grows up in India probably takes on as something that's valued being a cricketer. If you grow up in another culture, it'll be something different. So this has obvious advantages because although I've been born something that's seen as distinct, I take on what it means to be a man or I take on what it means to be a woman in that culture. So rather than a mind being behind what it is that I consider self to be, what we're saying here is that my sense of self is practical rather than cognitive. Now it is of course true that you can reflect upon the kind of person that you are, you can judge and you can evaluate it, and you can become aware of it. But most of the time you're not, you are just being. You're being that thing quite naturally. So he would say, hiding here, in the ordinariness of engagement with the world, one encounters the self in what one does. And to put that into context, we do things that are seemingly quite peculiar, that are actually very normal. So there's this research that's been done by some feminist psychologists on common practices that women engage in. So they ask their participants to answer these questions. Have you recently removed any body hair from below the neck? Uh, I'm not going to ask you about that in a minute. Um, and it's interesting when people do answer this question because it is incredibly widespread. So almost 100% of women in the Western cultures that they were talking to remove some form of body hair below the neck. And that's irrespective of uh, their sexuality, their feminist beliefs, and so on and so on. So this shows us there's nothing actually that's inevitable about that. When you become sexually mature, you have body hair. So this must be a socially constructed notion. And it's also socially sanctioned as well. So the woman who does not remove 
hair in the appropriate places, armpits and legs and so on. People will point them out. I don't know if you remember when Julia Roberts was on the red carpet and the photographers got her to wave because, uh, God forbid, they actually saw some hair under her armpit and they wanted to photograph it. So this tells us that what it is to be a person of a particular type, even something as fundamental you think, as a woman or as a man, is constructed. So Simone de Beauvoir says, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. And Bakewell, in her book, The Existentialist Cafe, which is a great read, says that de Beauvoir points out how our choices and habits over a lifetime construct an understanding and a practice of who we are. And Marcel, who's also in that familiar uh, perspective of existentialism, says that this can become our own self-produced uh, prison or shell from, uh, from which we cannot break. And of course, other people can do that to us as well. So I'm focusing very much on what we do to ourselves. And for balance, uh, men now are a little bit more pressured to be physically a particular type of person. So in the past, we had drive for thinness in women. Now we've got a drive or an adonis complex in men. So the steroid use of the younger age and so on and so on. And whether the hirsute man or whether the sort of classic Greek and Roman uh, uh, clean-haired norm is the one that you like. So these are organismic identities. Imagine a situation like Castor Semenya, who has her very nature of her existential being debated in a public forum. I just <coughs> astonished the courage of this woman. So she's somebody who, for whom they'll say, other athletes will say, well, she isn't like us as a woman. So there are these contested identities within that seem relatively biological. We also have chosen identities, of course. So there's great work in subculture literature, uh, Dick Heppage and so on, on the identities of music, of punk, uh, of uh, fashion. And we've also got ones which are political identities that we choose as well. So here we've got Britain first, and here we've got an anti-fascist name. So am I actually weak? Well, to an extent, I am. It's not a case that I'm simply an individual in an atomistic sense. And there's lots of great work now on social identity and social identity theory, um, which you can have a look at. It's uh, one of the, the key theoretical perspectives of modern social psychology. In a way, it was kind of um, uh, it was anticipated by William James, as so many things were, when he said that, in fact, I wrap up other things, other identities, and other people in what I consider to be me. He says, how can I tell if I identify with it? Well, if there's an emotional response that corresponds with your emotional response, then effectively I do consider it to be a part of me. So if your fortunes wane and I feel sad about that, then I'm really considering you. I'm including a consideration of you in myself. We'll have this on lots of different levels with football teams, uh, with other ethnic groups, and so on. But there'll be different degrees of centrality, so at certain moments something will mean a lot to you that's a, uh, a collective identity, it will be a salient part of who you are. So if I talk to people who've engaged in peaceful protests or engaged in violent protests like terrorist action, there's typically a particular point when they become acutely aware of their membership of a group in that they feel that they're being discriminated against in a, in a way that's very meaningful to them, and then they decide that they are going to act, and I'll get onto that later when I talk a little bit about protests and protesting against things. So there's different degrees of centrality in self, but the other thing is that these things are in flux. So we often think of ourselves as an entity, as an object, that's permanent, but in fact we're sort of moving through time. And the degree to which we can uh, affiliate with these different identities is a to change as well. Somebody who's looked at how we perceive a particular reality in the world, so how a group of us or individuals will say, this is the correct way to behave, is uh, Sharif. Now, he's one of the, the forefathers of social psychology, I guess. And he did a really interesting study because he's saying, well, so much of the way that we perceive reality actually guides our behavior. It's got a potency to it. So when I was saying earlier, we're born into a particular world with a particular way of being, there will be a norm that's already apparent. So do we view the world in our way, or do we view the world in the way in which that culture uh, has already dictated that it should be viewed? <coughs> a relatively simple way of doing this, uh, he took an autokinetic illusion, so imagine this room is entirely dark, and you just see a white pinprick of light that's stationary. Actually, your brain will tell you that it's moving, typically about It'll think that it's moving about two to four inches, although it's not moving at all. You've got no frame of reference. 
Um, sometimes this is uh, the reason why people think there's UFOs in the sky, in fact, um, because there's nothing else in the sky, so we think it's something to be there. So Sharif got people in the laboratory say that you'd be in a laboratory like this, this room's completely dark, there's just a pinprick of light. And he asks people, initially individually, to say how far that pinprick of light has moved. Everybody comes up with their own norm initially. So you form your own norm. He did this lots and lots of times. And then he put people in a group. And you can see here, hopefully, on the graph that we go from somebody who thinks it moves about an inch, somebody two inches, and then somebody else who thinks it moves about eight inches. When you're in the presence of others, it quickly converges over time, and you establish a relatively stable group norm. The interesting thing is that those people believe that their perception is their own and they're completely uninfluenced by others. So sometimes when we ask people why do you do the thing that you do, you'll have an individual response to it and you'll think that it's your own. But what Sharif is telling us is you cannot understand that individual's response without having an understanding of the broader social context in which they reside. And he says this is true for even basic kind of needs. You probably don't eat pizza for breakfast, unless you're really sort of uh, living it up the night before and it seems like the thing that you need. Uh, so what you, you think about it, we've got protein, <coughs> fat, carbohydrates. Uh, in this particular culture, whether you go for porridge, cereal, things like that, you go to Italy, you might, oh my goodness, they're, they're serving cake for breakfast, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, the group that you're in will define things differently. What is considered to be an appropriate or an inappropriate sexual practice too will be sort of defined by the wider group. There's a great study that was done after this, so this one was done in the 60s, I really like it, where they had what we call in psychology confederates. Those are people who are already in on the experimental hypothesis. So they've been told by the experimenter, hey you three, what I want you to do is to always say that that light dot has moved 16 inches. That is massive, it's extreme. And what they do is they put a naive participant in there with them. So the naive participant goes first and they say, I think it's moved three inches. The other three all say 16, and then you find that very, very quickly the naive participant joins them. Then the interesting thing that they do is they get rid of confederates at the end of those four trials. So now you've got two confederates, one participant who's gone right the way through once, and then a new naive participant. And they keep following this pattern. So eventually, you have no confederates, but you have people who have joined naively and gone along with them. This kind of extreme view tends to last for a few generations, but then die out. Uh, it turns out that people are, you know, particularly in circumstances where there's uncertainty or stress, they'll be more likely to go along. Now, if you think about it with leaders of extreme groups, they are often pointing to uncertainty and stress. They're saying, hey, follow me, because all of these bad things are going to happen, and look at this group over here. Your life is going to be worse. So it's quite a common sort of narrative and discourse, I think, that we're accustomed to. So the implications of this are that your perception of reality cannot be understood without the broader kind of framework. And without, in some way, uh, an understanding of the history of the group that you're in as well. So this is something where psychology doesn't do particularly well, typically. Uh, we don't tend to look at the historical perspective. So there's lots of laboratory work where we'll get somebody into the lab and test them there and then immediately. There's no sense of the past and there's no sense of the future. But those of you in other sort of humanities and social sciences, uh, that would be more fun than you. But the thing is that those cultural understandings become embedded as part of us. So one way of looking at it is that the culture's past is your future. So if we look at something like the human rights issues, say, so then we can perhaps understand, but not necessarily uh, agree with, things like tribal circumcision as a norm uh, among girls in a particular cultural group, in, in this case, uh, a Kenyan tribe. So tribal, so it's a collective identity. Circumcision is a particular behavior for a particular group. So it's, uh, it's the women in this case, and the norm. So it becomes an incredibly difficult thing to fight against because it's always gone on this way. For us though, it's, I think this is one of the UN uh, issues, isn't it, that it's addressing. So we'll see this kind of behavior as something that's intolerable. Interestingly, uh, as Miriam was saying with uh, my research on erotic love, so, you know, we can look at things that are essentially social structures, like marriage, 
And so well, in, most, in a lot of cultures, they say, well, the natural understanding is heterosexuality. So in fact, so when we interview people who are same-sex relationships, uh, they haven't been able to engage in a relationship in which they can broadcast that relationship or uh, express it and celebrate it publicly in the same way. So their sense of the potential future for themselves is different than the person who grows up in a heterosexual society too. One of the things, so one of my master's students, Alison Stimson, at the moment, she's going to be interviewing people in same-sex relationships who are old enough to uh, have been dating prior to uh, civil partnership being legal in 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, and then we have marriage in, in 2013. Then on another level, of course, in some cultures, child marriage is something that's understandable and acceptable within their framework. But have a look at what Save the Children are saying, is that girls, in particular, it's, always, it's, it's often girls who are uh, undermined, uh, can survive and learn. So they're not in a position where they've been able to develop or to select a path for future development either. So surely there is an I. There is an I, of course. So much of what I've emphasized is that there's a we. There is an ongoing understanding of experience. So in psychology, we would say that there's sort of a, a fluidity of experience. And there's an ongoing self-awareness. So I know that I'm talking to you right now without having to say to myself, what am I doing? And reflecting. You will know that too. Even in your... Uh, the most absorbing moments that you have, the flow moments, uh, whatever they happen to be, whether it's filmmaking, photography, and so on, you will know that you're doing that thing. So Dan Sahabi, uh, Danish phenomenologist, he says that this is the basic and fundamental form of self. It's constituted through experience. Somebody else that I really like is Ernesto Spinelli. He's, he points out that we do have this ongoing experience, this fluidity, but we also have a self-concept. And that is what you consider yourself to be. And that this appears to us to be relatively sedimentary. So you have a relatively permanent, permanent not, maybe not permanent, but predictable understanding of yourself. That can be challenged, however. So some things are kind of categorical, and they're relatively, they persist over time. So, you know, British, uh, male, and so on. Some other things uh, will be more open to change. So for an example, uh, it's similar to an example that Spin uh, Spinelli gives in his book, uh, The Mirror and the Hammer, but it's come up in uh, my talking to people as well, is one young woman, so she grows up understanding that what she will be is heterosexual, because that is the dominant kind of narrative frame in the culture that she's born in, which is a Western one. But she's from a particular cultural group who don't uh, value same-sex relations. She's very religious herself, so the religious group doesn't value uh, same-sex relations either. Then her experience, her ongoing experience, is that she unexpectedly to herself falls in love with a woman. So her experience is one of intense sexual passion for the other person and then actually falling in love with her. So what do you do with that? So your, your fluid experience is one that challenges your self concept. Now remember, her cultural, uh, her cultural identity is important to her, her religious identity is important to her. So it, that kind of thing, if you cannot manage it, you cannot express who you are that can become a bit of a problem to us. So you either open up your self-concept of challenging experience and you say to yourself, either I'm a lesbian, which you'll note is relatively fixed and entity-like as well, or I'm sexually fluid, or, as Spinelli would say, I am being lesbian at the moment, so everything is about to change. I don't think that that's, I think that's an accurate representation of this. And I find that very useful too. So. The thing is, there are different ways of looking at authenticity. So when I interview artists, sportsmen, and women, and so on, it's often about authenticity. But for all of us, this will be an important part in life. So one way of looking at it is that your internal state, so how you're feeling, your ongoing experience, your behaviors, and your interactions with others and your presentations in the world, are congruent. They're all in the same sort of line. Um, if they're not, and if this young woman feels like she cannot, and she chose not to, come out to her family, and come out to her culture, and come out to her religious group, then you are not, in that sense, expressing authenticity. So, I mean, I don't mean to say that in a uh, degrading way for her, that's a choice that she's made, given the pressure that she feels that she's under. But it possibly will have circumstances, psychological circumstances, for who she is. Remember, she's in a culture, our culture, where it is not illegal, criminal, 
to be in a safe sex relationship. There's another way of looking at authenticity, which is a little bit more integrated into the rest, rest of the world. And it says you feel particularly authentic when you take on a project that you can commit yourself to, you feel direction in, so that has a future focus, and gives you coherence. So all of the individual things that you do in life, as it were, add up to something. Now, that does imply a future, but of course it means that if you're going to commit yourself to something, that something has to be available in the culture as well. So um, I, think I, uh, I think Claire Rathbun um, put me onto this, which is this autonoetic consciousness, uh, mental time travel, something that's distinct in human, which is we can reinterpret the past and we can place ourselves into a, a different future. And if we can do that, if we can follow this, it helps give us a sense of uh, overarching coherence in life, what William James called right direction. But that does say that there is a direction. Sartre tells us that in a way, although this sounds quite odd, I am what I am not. What he means by that is that you take on the thing that you want to be part of. So, do some work, a uh, little bit of work down at the UK Defence Academy, and uh, one of the things down there is for marine recruits. So the recruits are not yet marines, but they're doing everything it needs to be a marine. So they're climbing that 30 foot rope with a 50 pound pack on uh, And they will find out at some point whether they do become that thing or not. So part of being authentic is to follow a path and a potential way of being that is meaningful to you. But not every potential way of being is open to everybody. And I know that some of the uh, examples that we've taken here are uh, relatively straightforward to see, but in our culture, for instance, people have uh, consistently thought that women are less able to do science. Well, this, regardless of whether this is untrue, what happens is that people have fewer opportunities to engage in that particular endeavor. And they, the marginalized group, this is the pernicious thing of this, may start to internalize that as cultural meaning themselves as well. They think, I won't be any good at this because I am a girl. And we can see in school children, so self-efficacy is your belief in your capability to do something. So we can see in school children that teenage boys and teenage girls have different levels of self-efficacy. Boys are particularly high for both male and female professions. Girls, self-efficacy is only high relatively for uh, what is considered culturally to be female professions. So they are already learning to block off a particular avenue for growth. Those views are open to change, of course. Uh, so one thing to do is to highlight the exceptional. So Helen Sharman, she's a British astronaut. She goes around to schools talking about what it is to be a scientist in order to inspire young girls. Uh, and another thing I saw on International Women's Day last week, somebody praising the uh, Radio 4 show, Life Scientific, uh, for being progressive. Jim Al-Khalili responded by saying, well, actually, half of the people on my show, on this show, are women, because half of the people in broader society are women. It's interesting that he thought it was progressive, because it seems like there are so many more women than there are on other shows. So the importance also of not highlighting simply the norm and the exceptional, because somebody might think, well, sorry, the, uh, the exceptional, somebody think, might think, I'm not exceptional. So you need to highlight the norm. And this also acts to dampen down stereotype threat. So if you believe that something is, if you really resonate with science, then you're a girl. You think, oh my goodness, if I get involved in this domain and I fail, it's not just my failure. It's I'm failing on the behalf of other girls and women as well. Um, so all of these things are you know, really subtle and complex. So in summary, what is a person? We're socially embedded, we have a natural engagement with the world, the things with which we identify are a part of the self. This must be a challenge for you out there. So. <laughs> uh, our personal reality is guided by social reality. We are self-reflected, and all of that can be disrupted, and that can alter that disruption, our understanding of the world and our place in it. We are temporal beings, so this is an important thing, is that I can look upon the world and I can think, I don't have to simply create, recreate what's gone before. I can imagine a different future. Presumably that's what you're doing in the Human Rights Festival too, I imagine. You can experience yourself as more or less authentic. You're influenced by other people's views of your identity. So an important thing is that someone will have a particular view of me because of the group that I'm in. But I, my view of myself might not be just based on what I think I am, what they think I am, it'll be what I think they think I am. 
whether they do or they don't. That's called the looking glass self in human uh, So all of those givens lead, lead the person open to change. And social forces also in the social world can change and can facilitate opportunity. But what if it doesn't? Then we engage in protests. I love this, you might not be able to see it there, but it says, sorry for the inconvenience, but we're trying to change the world. Uh, which might be familiar to some of you in the human rights there. The first thing tends to be that we have a shared grievance. I say, it's not just me, it's these people. So we see the NHS here. <clears throat> then there's a particular identity, so I start to identify with the rest of the group. The social identity is seeing who I am in social category terms. I act like a group member. Whoever is um, protesting here against Putin is particularly brave, of course, uh, on, on sort of the basis of their, their sexual identity. So we've got the grievance, we've got identity. We also have efficacy. So in this sense, it's not self-efficacy, my belief in my own capabilities. This kind of social efficacy is can we as a group get together, unite, and fight? And the other aspect of efficacy is the political one. Will the system be receptive to our claims? Now there's quite often an imbalance that's deliberate, or at least is serving a particular power. So it might not be that they are receptive to your claims at all. So the importance, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned explicitly in this, Van Stekelenburg and Klamath's work. So they do some excellent work on social identity and protest. It's fantastic. So they wrote this in 2009. And what they're pointing out there is the importance of social embeddedness, because that gives us a social capital. So my resources are far greater, because I'm not simply acting on my own. Anymore. So the kind of substructures of social embeddedness are these. There's a structural relation. So that's literally the network. How many people can I reach? Now, even in 2009, they were saying that that's not the most important one. But these days, I think it is incredibly important. There's a relational aspect to it. So what you do is you build trusting relationships. And then there's a cognitive aspect too. So your group will build a particular uh, set of uh, social identities and representations and of meanings of what it means to be a good member. And then you can hold each other to account. The reason I point out the sort of uh, uh, the social embeddedness and relational nature is such things as social media. So you get Arab Spring in 2011 was very much influenced by the network and by how many people can be reached. On the other side of the coin, uh, we've got uh, uh, Harun Okay Allah here, and what, he's an expert on terrorism. And what he says is, so his book came out just uh, in the autumn of digital world war. And he points out that IS or ISIS are losing the physical battle, but they're winning the online battle. They are identifying people who've got identity grievance, and they are disproportionately targeting them with their online campaigns. Now, what do you do with that? I know that there's discussion about, okay, if you can see, of course you can monitor to an extent who is clicking through. If they want to go and help in Syria because of a particular identity grievance, do you funnel them to an organization that does more beneficial content, or is that an unethical thing? Last week too, so we've also got a consideration of the external structure in our protest as well. So uh, John Lewis uh, uh, in the US was saying that it's 53 years since he protested on the bridge at Selma. So it's the Selma to Montgomery marches uh, in order to uh, demonstrate the constitutional right to vote. So what they will be doing is they'll be assessing the external structure's permeability. Can we, as underprivileged members, move up to the next level? They'll be looking at the stability. Are these structures fixed or are they variable? And they'll be looking at the legitimacy as well. Is it fair that there's this disproportionate way that we're being treated? Of course not. So this is what we call a normative form of protest because it's within the existing rules of society. You can protest peacefully. Um, this in uh, Northern Ireland, so somebody that I interviewed who was one of the civil rights leaders there, this is the famous Bloody Sunday marches. So it's a very important issue because young fellows join the IRA. Right? So it's normative action that can, then is responded to in a way that involves the killing of some of their people. And then of course, some people are gonna look at that and they would say, well, we're being treated in this non-normative way. 
their ethnocentrism, who they are as a collective becomes particularly salient to them if you think back to the way that William James talks about the way that we and I are kind of in flux all the time, and they may engage in action. This is actually an account of somebody from a slightly different critical incident, but it, he was running to the aid of a young boy who'd been shot uh, by the, the British. Um, so he said, so quite honestly, within maybe an hour, I've been sat there on my own, and I said, right, that's it, the gloves are off as far as I'm concerned. So I went in and I seen other people, to cut a very, very long story short, I got them stuck into the bricks every time I got a chance. So the BBC has done a little schematic in Northern Ireland. Uh, so my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Neil Ferguson and Ian Hollywood as well. What this says is you've got an individual in a particular environment who have competing ideological positions. There's a critical incident that leads to a period of reflection and then action. Um, and the thing is that that action, then the person's identity becomes synonymous with that action. Essentially what they're saying is that I recognize fundamentally what I am as a human being. Uh, and then, as Camus tells us, every part of himself, their self, that they wanted to be respected, they proceed to place above everything else and proclaim it to be preferable to everything, even to life itself. Now, any of you who are engaged in human rights work will know that that's true too. So I interviewed somebody in the Czech Republic who was in charge of 77. So they were protesting against the totalitarian totalitarian regime of the Soviet Union uh, during the 70s and essentially the people who wrote and signed the charter were saying irregardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves we live as free individuals so this person was hounded by the secret police who weren't so secret now, actually in any case you can always tell who they are they were even saying to them well where are we going for dinner today and so on and so on but they were there and he knew that he was heading towards imprisonment and he was heading towards being treated very, very poorly um, and again, another expression of this kind of identity is this is a woman who I interviewed, who we interviewed, I should say, uh, who was in the IRA. And she's saying uh, that, that there was nothing they could do. I was prepared to stand up and say, you can knock me down, I'm not going to go away. I'm going to be there, I'm going to try and do my best to achieve what I set out to achieve. So there's a shift in collective identity. You become more aware of the group that you're a part of, you start to define yourself in those terms. Once you get involved in a protest group, actually the number of different types of people that you're involved in tends to diminish as well. So there's a relative homogeneity. So this is part of what people talk about in terms of the staircase to terrorism, is that the cells that you come across in the end have got a lot of similar thoughts to them. So it's very reinforcing. Um, Gerard Post is excellent on this. I disagree with him to an extent. He says that an individual's identity will be subordinated to the collective. I think that both agency and collectivity are right. Uh, and then what happens is, so just to use Northern Ireland as a bit of a case study, again, it's a different civil rights leader that I'm talking to here. He says there's a lot of pressure to actually honour the conflict of the past. And you can see it in the murals here. Uh, so this is in a, a loyalist uh, community, this is in uh, uh, nationalist uh, community uh, and this uh, mural here is even sort of making reference to Che Guevara and we've even got a, a poster of Che Guevara in our office. He's become a cultural icon essentially of what it is to express freedom so in a, in a way you're tapping into a cultural and historical narrative of what it is to be uh, a defiant rebel. Uh, and as this person points out, says that then the culture has a kind of vested interest in keeping that division between the two of you as well, or between those two groups. Because there then exists a hierarchy within those groups, and you have political leaders that are powerful, and, and they've got a ready-made group of voters who are going to vote for them. So it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And then what do we have? Go back to the way that I started. Say so your self-understanding is guided by the culture that you're in, and that culture that you're in will have a particular script. So what is it to be a young boy? Well, Paula Muldoon showed in some of her focus group research that some boys, teenagers, and young adults in particular communities felt that violence was one of the ways that they should express who they were in terms of their identity. I wanted about 40 minutes rather than six half hours, and that is about 40 minutes. So, uh, just to get back to my original point, what is it to be a person, what is it, I hope that you've got a sense of the fluidity of identities, uh, the importance of different paths being open to you, 
if I look at Syria at the moment, how many, th how many things can boys and girls engage in in terms of their potential future when you see the destruction? It's absolutely uh, outrageous, of course. So what am I? I'm fundamentally, the way to understand ourselves is as an interrelational being. I'm always a being in the world, a being with others, and a being with self. Even if the way that I am is consistent, it's not staying the same, because it's becoming increasingly sedimented, so it's becoming increasingly reinforced, and it's increasingly difficult to change that. So with your human rights festival, good luck, and thank you very much for taking your questions.